Um, so without further ado, let me introduce the, the moderator of the panel, uh, which is Brian McDonald. Uh, Brian is currently a senior lecturer and research scientist in the Department of Statistics and Data Science at Yale University, where he focuses on statistics and data science education, sports analytics, and environmental data science. He was previously the director of sports analytics at ESPN and director of hockey analytics with the Florida Panthers Hockey Club and held faculty positions at West Point, Carnegie Mellon University, University of Miami, and Florida, at Florida Atlantic University. So let's give a big welcome for Brian. Thanks, Mark, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the, the conference um, and moderating this panel. Um, so just first thing that I kind of want to do is introduce the panelists. Lots of, lots of introductions going on. So uh, we'll start with uh, Tegan. So Tegan Bunsu Ashby is the Assistant Director of Software Engineering in Baseball R&D for the Philadelphia Phillies, go Phils, where she leads the application development, data engineering, and infrastructure teams. <clears throat> Before joining the Phillies in January of 2023, she worked in basketball for several seasons with the Brooklyn Nets and Philadelphia 76ers, go Sixers, uh, building applications and visualizations to empower, empower front office decision making and help win games. She's also the co-founder of the Women in Sports Data uh, Symposium and Hackathon, a game-changing initiative to amplify women's voices in sports analytics across the technical spectrum. She holds degrees in linguistics and Near Eastern languages and civilizations from the University of Pennsylvania, where she studied symbolic systems, formal syntax, um, ancient Meso Mesopotamian languages, and the world's oldest spreadsheets. Sounds like good uh, conversation uh, topic for the mixer after uh, after the panel. Next up, we have Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence Clark is associate dean in the University of Maryland's Office of Undergraduate Studies and a mathematics education faculty member in the College of Education. With his colleague Stephanie Timmons-Brown, Dr. Clark co-founded a summer experience for middle school students, exposing them to elementary statistics concepts, data analytics, and STEM uh, career exposure in sports context. In 2019, his team received a grant from the National Science Foundation in the Advancing Informal STEM Learning category to continue and expand the project to a second site, Coppin State University, a historically black university in Baltimore, Maryland. Next, we have Michael Shuckers. Shuckers is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Statistics and Data Science at St. Lawrence University. Shuckers has published dozens of papers on analyzing data in sports, especially ice hockey, and was given the 2013 Significant Contributor Award by the Section on Statistics and Sports of the American Statistical Association. He is also involved in developing statistical methods for bioauthentication devices such as facial recognition and finger, fingerprint readers. His research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Department of Homeland <clears throat> Security, the Department of Defense, and the Center for Identification Technology Research. Currently, he is co-principal investigator on the National Science Foundation grant to create the SCORE network which is a national network for developing and disseminating sports content. This is the acronym SCORE, sports content, sorry, sports content for outreach, research, and education uh, in statistics and data science. And then finally, we have Michael Lopez. He's the senior director of football data and analytics at the National Football League. At the NFL, his work centers on, uh, centers on how to use data to enhance and better understand the game of football. Academically, his research is split between causal inference with a specific focus on causal inference methods for multiple exposures and the application of statistics uh, to sports. He's an associate editor and a recent co-editor-in-chief at the Journal of Quantitative Analysis in Sports and has written for 538, Deadspin, Sports Illustrated, and Hockey News. From 2014 to 2021, he worked at Skidmore College, first as an assistant professor and then as a lecturer and research associate. And in 2020, he was named the American Statistical Association's Section, uh, Statistics in Sports Significant Contributor Award. So um, now you know everything there is to know about our panelists. Um, 
almost everything. Um, so I guess the first thing that we're, that, we're, that I'd like to do is just uh, the panelists can maybe give a, a little bit more of an in-depth uh, introduction to themselves if there's anything um, anything that they think is relevant. Um, and then to, to summarize the initiatives that we kind of um, introduced uh, as part of their bios, the initiatives that they're a part of um, that are related to outreach and sports analytics. I think I specifically requested not to go first, but uh, this is the luck of the draw. That was, um, that was Lopez point, not you, not me. <laughs> So I believe we're all here to learn about how Sumerian and the study of cuneiform apply. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm Tegan. Uh, I'm uh, the Assistant Director of Software Engineering. Um, also an honor uh, for a software engineer to be invited to Nessus. Um, I run um, all of our software engineering at the Phillies. Um, we're one of the largest software engineering te uh, teams in professional sports. Uh, we have a pretty wide remit. We work directly with our data engineers as well as our external stakeholders in the front office, to coaching staff, um, to player development, uh, to scouts. Um, it's uh, a lot of games uh, and it's a lot of fun, um, but I am losing the dollar dog night competition. Uh, we just held Women in Sports Data, um, our second annual symposium, this past weekend, so I'm also extremely tired. Um, Women in Sports Data is um, an incredible um, event. Uh, it's about 250 attendees. Um, our gender diversity split is about 70% uh, female to 30% uh, male, uh, making it quite possibly the most equitably attended event in sports analytics. Uh, just spitballing here and looking at the crowd, I would estimate that there's not 30% women in attendance. Um, so I would highly encourage um, everyone in this room to consider attending um, next year. Uh, but Women in Sports Data is intended to platform women working in technical roles, um, whether they're a data scientist, an analyst, a software engineer, um, in professional sports, because so often we're asked only to speak if we're asked to speak at all about the experience of what it's like to be a woman. And I think that that question is uh, very boring. Um, and it's been asked and answered um, in, in, in many ways. Um, so we feature a slew of panels of women um, who are general managers. Um, we had Amber Nichols, GM of the Capital City Go-Go, um, assistant general managers, Alex Mendricki of the Seattle Kraken, um, several NBA assistant coaches, data scientists um, across all four major men's league uh, leagues. Uh, and we just have conversations about the things that we actually work on. Um, this year, we also featured a uh, technical, track, uh, te technical talk track um, with six talks, um, including um, one from the NFL's own Ashani Desai, um, who, actually, who absolutely slayed. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, it's kind of a, a dream conference to go to because um, it's technical in, in a way that um, is accessible, I think, to everyone, but it's geared um, to have real conversations about what the direction of sport um, is, is going to be. And I think that it's absolutely essential um, for that future to be as inclusive as possible. I'll, I guess I'll go next. I'm in working left to right or right to left. Uh, <clears throat> Tegan mentioned the ratio at Women in Sports Data. I run an event at the NFL League office called the Big Data Bowl. Um, uh, it, it probably could be part of my bio, but it was also part of a lot of the morning's talks here, which is, is such a great thing to see um, because it's sort of been my dream from the start that football would be a bigger part of academic conferences and that the, the most up-to-date and novel research in American sport would be in football. Um, thinking back to our first year of the Big Data Bowl, we had an email address called bdbsubmit at nfl.com, and I had promised the league that we would have uh, hundreds of submissions and there would be a lot of enthusiasm and maybe 48 hours before the submission deadline my boss asked me at the time you know how many people have submitted and I said seven and um, it was it was kind of like my ass was on the line right like if nobody submitted to my competition uh, we would not be having a competition again so that night you know of course 
uh, I forgot that people kind of wait till deadlines to actually submit something. Um, so we had about 75 papers come in, uh, which, you know, when, when you include the number of participants, put us well over 100, and, and so I was pretty happy. But that first year, I reflected on the names of the people that were submitting, and there were a lot of Mikes, there was a lot of Toms, there were some Marks, there were some Lucases, there, there were some names that um, largely reflected white men. And so I pretty realized pretty fast that if we were going to do this in year two, if we didn't change, the names weren't going to change either. Um, so beginning in uh, that second year, we started a mentoring program. Uh, the goal of our mentoring program is to identify folks that are tr not traditionally in sports analytics and hook them up with somebody on a team, give them somebody to bounce ideas off of, uh, places to turn to for coding advice. Um, we've paired somewhere between 16 and 20 matches each fall where uh, uh, we started with, with um, black and African-American and, and now we've expanded to, to a larger set of, of minorities. But realistically, anybody can apply to it at this point. Um, the goal is to pair them with somebody who can walk them through what it's like to be in sports analytics, uh, curate a Big Datable submission, and that mentoring program has been a part of the Big Datable for the last, uh, I guess this would be our fifth year of it. Um, and again, it started back to that first night of, of watching the submissions come in and, and being pretty thrilled that they were coming in, um, but also recognizing that you know, if, if Tegan saw a split at, at, at her conference or, or something that, you know, the, the split uh, of big datable submissions is, is not one that I would uh, like to remember fondly. Uh, so Shuckers um, here, and um, I guess I'm talking about the SCORE network, which Brian, I don't know, air quoted or numbered or something. Um, so sports content for outreach, research, and education. Um, so this is a program that's funded by National Science Foundation. Um, we just finished our first of four years of funding. Um, yeah, Brian's got the, the partners up there. Um, those are partners, some of whom know they're involved, some of whom maybe think they're involved. Um, but we are trying to build a network of building content um, for courses. Um, so our first goal is to build content that students, their faculty can take, instructors can take, drop right into their course. Um, one of the, the, the other goals is that we are trying to build um, this network using data sets that are outside the norm. Um, so one of the ways that we are trying to sort of expand the pool of folks that are getting involved in sports analytics is by saying, well, let's start looking at um, non-traditional sports, let's start looking at women's sports data, and let's start using that and highlighting that as part of our courses as to, you know, the things that, that students can be involved in. Um, and Brian, do you have the, there's the big list of folks who are actively involved. You want to put the last one up there, Brian? There you go. Um, so there's a QR code there. The URL is scorenetwork.org. Um, and, and you can join and become part of this network. Um, the, 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 I guess, last relevant bit, and I'll just take a, another couple seconds here, Lawrence, um, is that we're looking for people to submit data sets and to submit educational materials. They go, go through a bit of a curating review process and then they become published, uh, as well as the data sets. And so they are all there. Um, and so we built the infrastructure and we're starting to populate that with these educational modules. All right, I guess I'm the last one here. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lawrence Clark, um, and I am the PI on an NSF-funded project that's called Maryland Sports Data Camps for Youth. Very sexy title that NSF came up with. I had a much better title, but I think they wanted something a little more standard. But um, uh, I want to give you just a little bit of history of, and my background because it is relevant. I used to be a middle school math teacher uh, for eight years, any other middle school math teachers in the house? I didn't think so, um, but. I taught high school math. Oh, okay, all right, we got another one. But, uh, so, I, I really enjoy creating uh, learning spaces for middle school students. Uh, it's a very exciting thing to do if you've ever had the opportunity because you can't just straight teach them math and elementary statistics. You gotta make it fun, you have to make it interesting. And uh, so, but one of the things that I noticed about my middle school students, particularly my African American boys, is I would ask them or I would hear them talk about their favorite subject, and it would often be math. 
And then um, if you ask them what did they want to be when they grow up, they would say a professional athlete. So when you sit back and think about those two responses, how do you create spaces for students who, on one hand, are very academically drawn to a particular subject, but are through media representations, through socialization, particularly of African-American and Latino boys, perceive themselves to be or foreclose on a particular professional identity uh, around athletics. So I felt like it was very important to try to create learning spaces for students so that they would not have to foreclose around either. And Sports Data Analytics just felt like a good space to engage middle uh, school youth uh, around mathematics, elementary statistics, but in a context in which they felt um, like they belonged, you know? And so it's, it was a, uh, it's been a hard road in, in that we did it on a shoestring budget for many, many years before we got grant funding at the University of Maryland, my colleague and I, uh, Stephanie Timmons Brown. But then just before COVID, we got a grant through the advancing uh, informal STEM learning category, and uh, we were able to expand to another site. So just a little bit about our project. It is a three-week camp uh, in the summertime, but we also have activities in the fall and in the spring for students, and we culminate with what we call a spring summit in the spring. Um, the three-week camp engages them in, again, elementary statistical concepts, data analysis. We teach them a four-step data analytics process. Um, they do a project towards the end of the three weeks, and they do a big posters, just like the ones I saw out in the hall. And, and what's really crazy is like they ask some of the similar questions, but they just don't have the tools, you know, the methodological tools to explore them, obviously, in the ways that we do here at this conference. But it's really surprising. The It's not really surprising, but it's, it's, um, it's really a joy to see them ask questions and think in ways around really important, and we teach them what a statistical question is, not just a question. So they learn things about variability. They love correlations. They love visualizations and scatter plots, and uh, it's, it's just a lot of fun. So uh, fortunately, again, we were able to expand through the grant. We were able to expand to another site at Coppin State University, uh, and we've also created some really good partnerships with a good partnership with UMD Athletics, uh, which we hadn't had in the past, and we have uh, now we are partnering with the Baltimore Ravens, and so they're super excited about about working with us. So. That's what my project is all about, and I look forward to talking to you about it a little bit more. All right, thank you, uh, everyone. So, um, so a lot of um, sort of sports analytics, statistical thinking in sports, uh, is focused on measuring outcomes or defining what success means for a play, um, or determining or estimating like who's responsible for those outcomes or those successes. Um, or just quantifying other aspects of the game. So I'm going to ask, uh, you know, this, this next question. Um, I don't know. It's it's probably the most sports analytics type question to ask um, a, a panel like this. But um, how do you quantify uh, success for your initiatives, or um, how do you define success? So what outcomes are you looking for? Um, is it even possible to to quantify? Um, success and if so how do you how do you do those types of things I think for me success would be for women in sports data to not have to exist um, there's about 20% of software engineers uh, in Silicon Valley who identify as female um, that number is less than half in sports analytics so that's one shitty benchmark that we can try to meet um, I think one of the most rewarding um, things of having our second event this year was meeting so many women who had attended last year show up wearing team polos because they got to meet people who were working in the industry, whether it was the league office or um, teams who I had actively bullied to show up. Uh, and they got to talking about like, okay, like let me actually have a conversation with you about your skill set, what you want to do. Uh, and they didn't have to jump that hoop of having to prove that they cared about sports, that they were technical enough, um, or um, 
wanted to be in that space because they showed up and they were the default and they felt that they were welcomed in that space because they were explicitly invited. Um, so I think not having this initiative um, have a raison d'etre um, is kind of pie in the sky because um, it's just one vector of um, you know, systemic bias in society. But uh, I think if we benchmark against um, where we, um, what's the minimum of where we can get um, relative to who's being produced from computer science departments, who's being represented in industry, um, I, I think that would be the first step. It's pretty clear with our program, our, our job is to get a pipeline of folks qualified to work on NFL teams. Um, it's the main reason I started the Big Data Bowl in 2018. It's the main reason our mentoring program exists. Um, create a pipeline of qualified folks that are interested in working on the NFL. One of the things that is really difficult about American football is the amount of context that is needed to, to do well. And, and there's a hurdle when you're looking at tracking data. It's hard. It's tricky. It takes time to answer even the simplest questions. And it's off-putting to folks that maybe are looking at it for the first time. And so our, our job with the mentoring program is to get people hired. And if you can code, you can code. And, um, you know, our, it, it's a pretty simple benchmark for us. You know, we don't expect everybody who's a mentee who is matched to somebody to get a job in sports. Some of them decide it's not for them. Um, but, but having such a specific goal of the Big Data Bowl it ties directly to our mentoring program as well. Um, so assessing our grant is really um, about the number of users we have uh, for one of our metrics in terms of sort of the number of downloads. Um, the other thing that is part of our assessment plan is to um, assess uh, basically through a survey, right, who we are reaching um, through the educators. Uh, we have made some decisions in terms of not wanting to know who exactly is downloading stuff and not making some hurdles there uh, for making our materials available. And that then means that for our assessment, we're going to have to rely on some, some proxies. Well, similarly, um, because it's grant funded, uh, NSF likes lots of measures and lots of surveys and things like that. And so we do have pre and post assessments of their, their statistical knowledge. We have STEM interest surveys. Um, and we are tracking our students over time to see their math and statistics course taking and interests over time. Um, and we also have a, an interesting measure that's uh, an athletic identity uh, survey, which can measure the extent to which students sort of foreclose around an athletic identity. In other words, they only see themselves as athletes and not uh, take on other identities, such as an academic identity or STEM identity. So we're trying to, what I would love is for our participants to delay foreclosing around just an athletic identity for as long as possible to see themselves as being able to operate in uh, multiple spaces particularly our African-American boys, and not just um, identify as wanting to be uh, just professional athletes, because that sets in very early with, with them. And um, so to, to delay that as much as possible through creating spaces for them to be uh, all of themselves it would be what I would be considered, uh, I would consider that success. I will say also we have lots of focus groups and, um, and we employ uh, underrepresented student athlete STEM majors in our project. And it's very nice to see the young people engaging with them and wanting to be like them. And to really, they, they really like the undergraduates a whole lot more than they like the older people. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say is parent testimonials are really amazing when parents will come up to you and say that, you know, he didn't like math or, you know, he didn't, you know, in school, he's just, you know, he doesn't, you know, engage like this. And so, um, so that's success. Okay, so um, I guess one uh, other question I was kind of interested in asking this group since uh, there's, there's some of these initiatives are kind of um, sort of uh, being formed and run within academia, and some are being formed and run within industry. So 
kind of just wanted to ask a couple questions sort of about maybe some of the uh, uh, differences there. So um, what are some of the, you know, and some of the panels have worked or, or are working in education. Um, what are some of the benefits or maybe some drawbacks to using sports um, or sports analytics for a tool for promoting diversity in STEM education, um, outreach in STEM fields, and, and so forth? Because I think, you know, there, there's multiple ways you could do that. Why sports? Um, you know, what are some of the benefits and drawbacks to that? So I think the, the benefits um, are that for a proportion of our students, sports gets them really excited, right? And I can cover a lot more statistical models that are a lot deeper if the students are involved and engaged in a sports question. I mean, I think the drawback is that sports does not engage everybody. Um, and so, you know, we've been reluctant in St. Lawrence to do sports analytics sort of formal courses, um, in part because we, we've got some resource issues, right? Uh, but we've got some other courses to teach, but also because, right, as a place that's a liberal arts school, right, we want to engage everybody and we want to be able to have students see sports applications uh, across the area. So. Uh, those are the real strengths and weaknesses for me. You know, as an educator, and as I described, I think the benefits are pretty obvious that if we can engage students and get them excited about mathematics and statistics and analytics um, in a space that they enjoy and get excited about, then that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, I, I think the drawback for me, and I think about this a lot, is that because of the fact, uh, fact again that uh, our population in the in the camps are primarily African American boys a part of me wonders if we are actually not reinforcing and perpetuating um, encouragement in a way for them to be professional athletes because we use professional athletics so much as the content of the camp so we're putting more images of um, professional athletes in front of them. And I just wonder sometimes, hmm, you know, is this actually, uh, it's, it's certainly not doing more harm than good, don't get me wrong, I never think that. But I do wonder sometimes are we just, um, again, pushing images and narratives in front of them. We're showing them the, the data analytics side of it. We're showing them STEM professionals, we're showing them data analytics professionals, but those are not typically African-American people or people of color. So, so they're still seeing the same images of professional athletes, success, that's what success means, that's what success is all about. So there's a, there's a bit of a tension there for, for me personally and the project, so I'm kind of working through that. And um, for the panels who are kind of running these things from within industry, um, how do you think implementing these initiatives uh, compared to like maybe if you were to try to implement some sort of STEM type initiatives, or outreach, initi outreach initiatives from within some other industry that you've been a part of or from, you know, in Lopez's case, from within academia? Um, what do you think, uh, are there benefits and drawbacks um, or additional challenges or maybe additional tailwinds to doing it from within sports? And the first thing that jumps to mind relative to life in academia where you can sort of frolic in your own area and, and, and spend time in, in different things that you're passionate about is, you know, we have a job. And, um, you know, my, my job is not to run the Big Data Bowl mentoring program. It's to analyze data for the NFL. Um, in fact, for all the mentors who put in time, their job is not to be a mentor. Um, for all the mentees, they're, they're doing it on their own time. They're not getting paid to be a Big Data Bowl mentee. And so it's effort, it's time, and it's uh, – and, and not, not everybody has that. You know, we at the league office have all committed to it. You know, the group of us that, that runs the, the mentoring program, there are a couple of folks here that are a big part of that. Um, they're awesome, um, but at the end of the day, it, it's not our job. We're not being evaluated on how we do at it. And, you know, that goes for the mentors. And, and so when, you know, we pair 16 or 20 folks up with people on teams, 
we're not going to go for 16 for 16. We're not going to go for 20 for 20. Um, because of the realities that we're, we're doing this on, on our own time. So I think that's the, the balance that we have is, you know, we, we, we want to define success as everybody getting hired, but at the same point, um, you know, our, our base rate is not going to be 100%. Yeah, to echo what Mike said, uh, women in sports data is not my full-time job. It, it's really not even my job. Um, women in sports data is organized by um, an entirely volunteer-led um, group of women um, who work for Zealous Analytics, um, the Astros, and, and the Phillies. Uh, and we do this because we're really passionate about it, and uh, we have a lot of experience in sports where uh, we've been um, the only one uh, in the room, and we didn't want um, the people coming up behind us to have that experience. Um, but it's also, I, I think there, there's a couple, like, things that I want to highlight about this. Um, one, um, it's incredibly risky for our careers um, to pour so much effort into this initiative because it takes away from our full-time responsibilities, of, uh, whether it's software engineering, leading R&D, being a machine learning engineer. Like that's time away from our core job. And uh, I think as many people in this room know, working in sports full-time can be life-consuming. Um, Two, um, I think that associating um, our um, organizer identity so strongly um, with um, DEI can also be um, reductive. That uh, that's all that we can contribute. Uh, and then there's a transfer, uh, a, a transitive property of women or underrepresented individuals should only be included in this space as if we're trying to decorate. Uh, the colors of Benetton um, ad for sports analytics without thinking about what is the work to make this space truly impactful, uh, truly inclusive. How do we set up this environment to be not only welcome, welcoming, but create a space for people to succeed and grow in these roles? Um, I also think that uh, the way that I've approached it um, in my role as a hiring manager. I think of women in sports data almost like uh, the, a, a, from a very front office oriented perspective. Um, I think about roster construction, player development, um, and I think that's exactly what we're doing with women in sports data. We're exploiting an, an, an underrepresented market. It's a market inefficiency that these candidates aren't being considered, that they're not being identified, and so through our conference, um, we get to meet these individuals first. We get to get, have conversations with them first. And the people that attend the symposium um, have that network. Uh, and so the people who are going to be populating um, the front offices of the future um, in five years, um, we believe, are attending WISD um, a weekend ago. So a couple of you mentioned um, mentorship programs or, um, you know, if not formal mentorship programs, at least interpersonal interactions and, and connections. Um, is, some, is some part of your initiative or in some cases a very big part of your initiative. Um, uh, in the post-COVID era, the Zoom virtual era, um, it seems a bit harder to, um, if you have a virtual component to your initiative, it seems a bit harder to sort of like build those connections and have those interpersonal, um, you know, interactions, uh, you know. Uh, can you just talk about how um, maybe like some best practices that you have learned over time or um, just what you think the best way to do that um, for, you know, things that have like a virtual component? Or if there's a way to do it? Um, so I, I think I mentioned that we received our NSF grant just before COVID. If I didn't mention that, I, if that's important because um, we tried to have 30 middle schoolers online uh, one summer. And I, you can imagine that it did not go over as well as we wanted it to. So it, it really is not at this point a, a big part of our project, um, although during our fall and spring activities, there is meetings between teams, data collection, online data collection, et cetera, but we don't centralize or use um, Zoom and online 
engagement with you got to think about the population with middle schoolers. Now they've learned to, they learned to do it through COVID, but because it's a, it's a very active camp, um, interactive camp that just doesn't lend itself well for that. Uh, and I, I, and I and I say it from experience. It was it was not great, but um, hey, we tried. So there's a, a virtual component to Women in Sports Data. Um, we host a six-week um, virtual hackathon sprint um, featuring donated tracking data. Um, this year, uh, we did um, the 2022 NBA playoffs. Um, our first year, um, we did um, men's Euros um, event data from StatsBomb. Um, and that's exclusively online. The first time that um, participants to the hackathon um, meet each other in person and come on site is when they um, come to present um, as finalists um, at the symposium. Uh, and we uh, have $10,000 in total prizes uh, in addition to um, full expenses paid trip to Philadelphia. Um, it was really important to us to recognize that this is labor uh, and that I think very commonly uh, people are given the advice uh, to build a project um, in their free time and we've found that underrepresented individuals often don't have as much free time to pour into that labor. Um, so uh, hosting a virtual hackathon over six weeks um, is, is fairly complex, especially when it's tracking data. So you can't really use Stack Overflow to find out how to <laughs> um, solve uh, really uh, gross and messy um, uh, tracking data. Uh, so we essentially cribbed um, the playbook from the Big Data Bowl. Um, and we have a mentorship program. Um, we heavily recruit um, people of all gender identities um, who work um, in professional capacities to serve as mentors. Um, we do um, a number of um, technical talks um, invited um, also of all genders um, to, to speak to participants and have um, uh, almost like coffee chats um, with people just so that you can kind of get used to seeing our faces uh, in a low pressure um, friendly environment so that when they do have the opportunity to come to Philadelphia or Brooklyn last year, um, that face is a little bit more recognizable and you have a mentor that um, you can reach out to um, in addition to your peers who are participating in the hackathon. Our, our, ours is tricky. We have, uh, I would like to be able to say that the 16 or 20 Big Datable mentees have the opportunity to interact with the 16 or 20 Big Datable mentors, and, and there's sort of a nice intermix between all, everyone, and you get a lot of that networking. Um, that's hard. I have a hard time setting up a Zoom where people get put in awkward rooms for five minutes and say hello, and here's my name, and then suddenly you're in a room with somebody else. Um, We've done a couple things. We've, we've set up LinkedIn groups. We've set up Slack channels so that folks that want to communicate in ways beyond having a Zoom call have that opportunity. Um, but it, it's still an area where we're looking for growth. You know, one thing we really like all the mentees to do is have a presentation at the end, whether it's a formal Big Datable submission, whether it's a class project you were able to do if you didn't have enough time to do a Big Datable submission. Uh, it's their opportunity. Um, and, and that we open up to all 32 NFL teams. Because um, we'd like to have a, as much of that intermingling a, as possible, um, but in the virtual setting, it, it's, it's maybe not as ideal as we want it to be. And I should have said this uh, at the beginning, but the first half of the uh, panel uh, discussion is going to be questions that, that I'm asking. The second half is going to be audience questions. Um, so I have a couple more questions, but... If you have uh, questions on your mind, uh, keep those in mind because uh, in a few minutes, five to 10 minutes or so, we're gonna start the, uh, the audience question portion of the uh, panel discussion. So um, I guess um, next thing um, that I'll ask is uh, just for maybe advice for people who are interested in um, either, uh, you know, first of all, like how can people get involved in any of these initiatives? Uh, some of you have already talked about that a little bit, but um, what advice would you have for someone interested in starting an outreach initiative like this? Um, and then sort of another thing I've been thinking about is, 
is uh, how, uh, sort of what is the most efficient use of our time? So if we're interested in one of these things and, and like how much of our focus should be on um, like a larger initiative um, like these and, and how much should be focused on sort of um, ourselves and uh, learning about our own biases um, maybe correcting some things that we do or uh, just changing sort of what we do um, in our either classrooms or our meetings or our data science teams or data engineering teams um, and just sort of making changes in our daily lives. Um, so both of those things, obviously, we shouldn't just choose one or the other, um, but I don't know. Is there any way that you think about those things and and how, uh, just the general idea of how to best efficiently use your time and energy and resources. So, um, I'm gonna take the second part um, of that. And I, I, I guess, um, Sometime in the last 10 years, I've started thinking about, so I've been doing sports analytics since 2010, um, and started thinking about the growth and what is the ecosystem of sports analytics, um, and how that has grown and changed over time. Um, and so to Brian's question about, you know, how much should we be doing individually versus large projects, I think we need it all. Um, you know, uh, I teach at a small liberal arts college. I reach 80 students a semester. Um, that is not a ton, right? And I'm not gonna change the sports analytics community by doing that. Can I change the sports analytics community by doing talks like this and being involved in larger projects? Yes. Um, I think I can have an impact that way. And so I think, um, you know, we need mixes of projects that are large and medium and small if we're going to make the changes that need to be made to our community. So I can speak to the first part of this in terms of advice. Um, as, as everyone on the panel has, has stated that we all have full-time jobs, so oftentimes this community outreach work is under-resourced or you don't have enough time or um, just there could be lots of challenges associated with it. So I really recommend that you have a team or partners or people that can help think through uh, the work and help support the work. You can't do it by yourself. Um, but I think you have to also be realistic about your time and um, because if you burn yourself out, then you won't be available for anything that, that you do. and But I think you should also be very, very focused around a particular effort um, and not try to do too much. And then, and also the last thing I'll say is that you just have to be patient because a lot of these, these initiatives require building relationships with uh, community members, getting the, if you work on a university campus, getting the trust of faculty, uh, getting the engagement of other faculty. Um, it just takes, it just takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. There's a market. We had 375 applicants to the Big Data Bowl mentorship program this year. Um, that's uh, in some sense awesome. Uh, in some sense it required an enormous time commitment because we wanted to read through every application to pick the, the top 16 or 20. I mean if you divide um, I mean, that's basically an acceptance rate of 5%. So uh, it's, it's extremely humbling to know that there are that many folks out there that want to be a part of our program. Um, it's, on the one hand, it's, it's, uh, it creates, as Tegan said, it's a market inefficiency. These people want to get into football data and currently don't think they have an exact avenue into it. Um, on the other hand, for us, it, it's, it's time and uh, making sure that we're purposeful, effective in terms of managing our time and expectations um, was definitely something my, my team was pretty good at in the last couple of weeks. Um, so I, I think that you know, the growth of, of our program is, is a credit to a lot of the other initiatives up here uh, in terms of identifying that, that sports data is a, a career for, for people out there. I think from the perspective of women in sports data, the most impactful thing that you can do is to attend. 
um, showing demand for this event, um, regardless of how you identify, um, seeing the value in, in the content, which is real, um, is both important for building the network for the people who we're trying to develop this pipeline. And as Mike said, that it's not that there isn't demand for entering the field of sports data. It's just that we haven't connected into those resources. We haven't demonstrated that this is a good faith outreach um, for this population. Um, so uh, attend. Um, if you work for a team or a league, um, you should mentor for the hackathon. Um, it's not um, too time um, intensive. Um, you're not supposed to read their code. It's more of a conversation of what's it like to work in sports? What are some interesting questions? Um, our hackathon prompt is always very high level of build something with this data that a front office or a coach might find interesting. And then connect um, those mentees, um, whether in our Slack channel um, or one-on-one um, -on -one coaching sessions, um, with people in the industry who could better help um, answer those questions. Um, another thing I think would be really um, helpful um, is if you uh, want to tap into this pipeline, um, particularly if you are representing a team, you should have a Women in Sports Data Fellowship. Uh, we've done them with uh, the Houston Astros, the Philadelphia Phillies, and the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, we have it, it, this application open like seven days, uh, and it's similar. We get we got uh, almost 200 applications in the span of a week, and every single um, applicant. Um, and that's in baseball, not football. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, every single applicant um, was competitive. Um, so they're trying to get into this space, uh, and, and it also uh, turns the spigot onto uh, really great resumes, uh, because something that women in sports data um, doesn't do is we don't just distribute resumes. That You have to be part of um, the supporting committee. Um, we're not just going to um, unleash, um, I think, bad faith um, supporters who just want to send us an email and feel entitled to, um, to, resor to resources, to human resources, um, the, the resume drop. That's, that's not what the program is about. Um, we want to make sure that people are getting into the right jobs. And so if you come to sport, Women in Sports Data and you're hiring, we help facilitate that. If you are a fellowship sponsor, then you get a resume book. If you are a financial sponsor, then you get a nice uh, logo in, in our, <laughs> our printed materials. But I think that's been um, one of the, the greatest accelerants of increasing um, female and, and non-binary representation in sports, I think. Um, off the top of my head, uh, an anecdote. Uh, when I started the NBA, there were maybe five women um, working um, in team operations. Um, and now um, we're, we're quite confident that we've, we've increased the directly from the first women in sports data um, to this year um, by 30%. Uh, which is a pretty dismal number uh, if you look at like the actual um, total, but uh, the rate I think is something that we can continue to capitalize on. Okay, uh, let's open it up now for audience questions. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and someone will gently throw a well padded cube in your general direction. So how do you how do you um, work on the actual like outreach and advertising of these programs so that you're not just <laughs> spreading and communicating to the circles that already exist? How you're actually connecting to communities that don't have these connections for these programs? We have had some of the folks on our data team over the last, I think, five or six years compile a list of every academic department um, that we can get our hands on that has a public either sports analytics group or statistics 
group major or when we're emailing department heads, every HBCU we have, every all women's college we have, it's basically like as many professors that we think can forward our information to students. Um, so that's that's one area is that we we just cold email people and say, do you have anyone interested in this program? We're doing this at the league office. Um, so that's sort of one outreach that we've done with the Big Data Bowl. Um, the second, which is is really not my sweet spot, is is we do have to sell our program to the league uh, in the sense that um, you know we're a niche data group running a, a niche data science competition. Um, we we don't get the press. We don't get on NFL.com homepage. Uh, we don't get on Good Morning Football. Um, we we have to do a little bit of work in the background, um, even just to like get a retweet. So um, that's takes some effort from our team to get the right PR set up. Um, not because I want to celebrate anything that we've done, but more because there's an audience out there that that's not going to be following our Twitter accounts that we will be missing. And even if we have a, a pretty low hit rate of, of using uh, a, maybe a more public outreach like that, um, it is going to reach a different audience. We do something um, pretty similar. Um, our organizers directly email um, as many statistics and computer science programs uh, that we can. Um, we have a database of contacts from university sports analytics uh, groups, whether it's an informal or formal group. Um, I also I have probably strained my relationship with Philly's PR and social media, um, begging them to um, to promote our event, and th and they've been fantastic. Um, but even just like the simple act of having a press release uh, and then sending it out to Philadelphia News um, turns into an article uh, in the Enquirer, and then uh, an, an email from. Um, somebody in the local areas. Like, I, I never even thought I could do something like this. Uh, I didn't know this was a career. Um, so it's kind of um, a, a wide blast radius of, uh, like, being too online um, and also directly out, like, getting comfortable with um, being annoying. So as I, I stated earlier, um, the grant is through the advancing informal STEM learning category for NSF, which means that they do not want your program, your, your initiative to be in school settings. That's the whole point. So they, just want, they want students to engage in learning outside of school settings, but they don't, they don't say you, don't, you can't recruit through school settings. So we blast all of the area schools so that we can get students to come to our, our program in the summertime. So we do leverage that, but, um, and we leverage churches, we do radio spots uh, when we need to, but we're also finding that um, legacy, like, so we've been doing it for many years. So family members know, you know, a child went through a couple of years ago and now there's a younger brother or sister. So we're noticing a lot of familiar, familial ties coming through our program, which is a good thing. And the last thing I'll say, you know, it was interesting one year we, um, the homeschooling network in the area got a hold of our program, found out about it, and we got a lot, and that's a very tight-knit group. And so um, we got a lot of applications through through that network, which is a great thing. Um, so there are lots of, there are lots of ways in which, which it can, we, we fill up pretty quickly through, you know, in our program. Yeah, I wouldn't, I guess, add much other than it's a challenge to, you know, because you're reaching outside your network. And so you've got to do the work of building a broader network. Uh, Tegan, you mentioned earlier that job seekers will frequently get the advice of, oh, just work on a project in your free time. And maybe candidates from underrepresented groups aren't able to do that as easily. As someone who's guilty of giving that advice over and over again, um, do you have any advice about how I can modify that advice to make it more equitably actionable? Hey, Scott. <laughs> I, I, I give that advice all, all of the time, too, because I think that it's one of the best ways to demonstrate that you have the sports context and domain knowledge to be able to thrive. I think. Um, particularly in sports not baseball, so basketball, football, 
Um, you have to wear a lot of hats. Um, you have to be that unicorn data engineer, data analyst, um, front end designer, uh, and uh, everyone that's evaluating your work or your potential isn't really going to have a lot of um, understanding on like what does it take to be able to do that. It basically, like you're a software witch, right? Like do the magic, please. Um, I think that uh, like one of the intentions of the hackathon. Um, and I, I am deadly serious that we plagiarized the big data bowl, <laughs> uh, was that we, we wanted people to get money um, to do this in addition. Like we wanted there to be compensation. And so I think that, um, like I don't know that it, like it's, it's bad advice because it's effective advice um, because it's such a great way um, for you to get noticed, for people to um, start to think of, of you as being part of the sports analytics community. Um, but I also think that it's per fairly underrated of how isolating um, and intimidating joining the sports analytics community can be. Uh, and so funneling people to um, a competition, whether it's Women in Sports Data or the Big Data Bowl, um, opportunities that remunerate um, in addition to um, just promotion. Hi there, I think I've got the next one. Uh, Elliot Schwartz, USOPC, so I'm gonna put in a shameless plug for, I'm glad Brian's here with me. So we're working together on the Yukon Data Challenge, so for the symposium next April, um, working together also with Greg Matthews and uh, Jun Yan and Lauren Poe, who are not in the room, but anyway, we're working together. The project is gymnastics, so Shuckers, it meets your goal with score of atypical sports. Um, it's men's and women's gymnastics data, so there's balance there for everybody. Um, thinking about the sport of gymnastics in the US, um, on our men's team at the upcoming World's Championships, we have two of our five athletes are black, two of our five athletes are Asian American. On the women's side, three of our five athletes are black, one is Asian American. So hopefully that will attract interest, but it's for high school, undergraduate, and graduate students. And um, if you're interested, you, some professors are using it in their undergraduate classes as projects or using it with analytics clubs. So we're trying to get as broad participation as we can, uh, but this can be a great opportunity to, again, meet a lot of the objectives that you've spoken about on the panel. I would say that did remind me of a shameless plug of my own, and it, that is, Philly's R&D is hiring in both data science and quantitative or software engineering roles. Um, I have um, an opening on my team for um, interns, a machine learning engineer, uh, and a designer coming up soon. Other people? So you're hiring. <laughs> yes. I'm not looking for a job. <laughs> but I'm curious, are you doing anything uh, you know, different from just putting the job uh, posting out there in order to attract a more diverse set of candidates? Like, What, what is your practice there? Phillies are very spoiled. We have a director of talent acquisition um, that helps um, spam um, a lot of um, non-traditional um, job boards uh, and resources. So we don't just post on Greenhouse or, or LinkedIn, although that is one of our primary modalities of um, publicizing our opportunities. Um, we also have um, like a pretty structured um, candidate evaluation process. So everybody receives the same questionnaire, everybody receives the same um, interview um, kind of playbook. Um, multiple people um, are will be on that in-person panel. Um, we've also started experimenting with uh, ChatGPT when doing technical evaluations um, so that um, you're um, your grade, or at least like one input to a, a grade of a technical project, um, is identity blind.
Congratulations, you've all been named czar of sports analytics outreach. What one change would you make to improve the environment when it comes to analytics in the uh, underdeveloped or underrepresented groups? Personally, I taught AP statistics for four years in high school, and I think the setup of 2022, uh, 2023, I'm still a year behind. Um, the curriculum at high school could be much improved to give people a better sense of what careers they can get into in college. I think a lot of people get to college and they um, go to a school that maybe doesn't have a, a strong data science program or anybody interested in statistics and sports, and they probably don't even know that career exists until you know, they're reading the Baltimore or the Philadelphia newspaper and they see that there's a conference in it. Um, and I think if the if the curriculum in high school was a little bit more modern, um, and I'm specifically thinking to changes that I wish I would have seen 15 years ago teaching AP stats, um, it's, it's old school, it is uh, taught towards an exam, and I do think it loses students from, uh, you know, what is a very modern technical field that they could have access to. I, I would just say start earlier. And what I mean by that is I um, have children, uh, they're engaged in uh, statistical concepts earlier in, in their lives than they are now. Um, it's very little content taught in elementary school and not much in middle school really for many, many students and, and even less so for uh, students of color or um, in underrepresented uh, communities. So I... I would encourage that uh, it be taught earlier and that uh, curriculum is expanded at the, at the elementary level. I would also say too that we have a lot of students, or a lot of young people that are engaged in out of school athletic associations such as AAU. I don't know if everybody's heard of AAU, which is this huge network of, of um, athletic activity, I mean, kids are playing foot, tackle football at young ages or basketball, and it's a huge network. I mean, it's, it's, I think students, kids are coming up through AAU much more so than they're coming up through even school sports now. So I would hope that those types of organizations would have some sort of educational arm to them that um, creates some high, higher expectations for engagement in STEM um, as a being as a part of participating in those types of, of networks. Um, I think I would remove economic barriers to participating in conferences like this for high school and undergrads. Uh, it's a pleasure to be the Zarina of sports analytics outreach. Um, I hope that my reign will be long and um, pleasant. Um, the, the, I mean, there's so many like one things that I would change uh, about this ecosystem. Um, so I'm going to cheat and uh, give two. Um, I think that uh, very selfishly, I think that we should be pushing software engineering skills a lot more. Um, because the scale of the data that teams are working with um, is um, exploding uh, and the margins between developing competitive advantage um, are becoming more slim. Uh, and I think that those gains are being made um, on the engineering side, particularly in data engineering, but across um, infra uh, and application development. And I think the kind of dirty secret about software engineering in sports um, is that um, it's the demand for it is, is much higher, and so it's a great entry, you know, entry point um, into uh, working in sports analytics. But also, as a software engineer, you have to work with stakeholders across the entire organization. So instead of being um, in um, a particular discipline or silo, um, it, it, it's functionally impossible um, to do that. Um, so. Big plug for software engineering as far as like opportunity. Um, the thing that I would, um, I, it, this is kind of piggybacking off of Shuckers, but uh, 
sport, working in sports is a passion economy and that benefits people that can afford to work in this industry. So we need to be much more competitive um, in our compensation across the board. You know, I know that I'm not gonna be able to compete with FANG for hiring software engineers, but I shouldn't have to compete with uh, like five person startup uh, in Philadelphia that's gonna go bust in four months. Um, thanks for the thanks for the very interesting panel. Um, so my question is for the beginning, basically, of a career in sports analytics. Um, I am in the situation, uh, and maybe other people are in the same. Um, but it's your it's a bit of an hesitation between like keeping uh, the range of sports in which you're interested quite wide, or deep diving into what it could be your your specific passion um, and try to really be focus your expert and develop an expertise in, in a specific uh, field. Um, what's your take on that? And uh, maybe how easy it is like afterwards to switch and to change uh, the, the sports you're interested in. Uh, if you realize it's, it's either you're stuck or you want to, to change. This is what I was going to say. I could yeah. not hear clearly what fully what the question is. Do you want me to repeat? Yeah, was it about like working in different sports? Uh, yeah, at the, at the beginning, I mean, uh, either starting keeping the, the range of opportunities open and trying um, maybe a wide range of sports and uh, playing quite widely or trying to be sp very specific and develop uh, specific ex expertise in one sport. I guess that's probably me because I've worked in multiple sports. Um, uh, I have the advantage of being a software engineer, um, so um, I, I think I'm a little bit more removed from the um, like modeling considerations. Um, although I do have to, um, uh, in my IC work, um, work to be able to translate that into a usable product, um, and that involves a lot of um, conversations and asking people, you know, what are your problems? Uh, and you kind of have to train yourself to um, listen without um, believing. Uh, I think there's this kind of common user experience story about, you know, people will tell you um, exactly how to solve a problem, but if you did exactly what they wanted, you would just build them a faster horse when really what they want is a car. Uh, and so, like, our job is to build Ferrari. Um, I think, like, my transition to baseball, um, my, like, my entire career in sports has been by accident. I didn't really envision myself working in sports, even though um, my personal religion is Denver Broncos football, um, having grown up uh, in Wyoming. Um, it's why the um, sunsets are, are blue and orange. Um, uh, <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's true. Um, I was a massive sports fan, but I never considered it because I didn't really know um, that um, that you could work in sports or anyone that, that looked like me um, would have an, uh, um, an option to work in sports. So I don't have like really um, great advice for um, like developing a targeted um, transition to sports. Like I don't think that I would want to work in baseball if I didn't find it fun, um, and, and the same for, for basketball. I, I think like the more that you work with this data and you engage with this community, you rapidly find out, like maybe cricket's not for me. Um, but <laughs> but I, I don't know if that, that answered your question. I mean, I, I just, from the Big Data Bowl's perspective, I mean, there's not a, a sports league that I know of that hasn't hired from the Big Data Bowl at this point. And it goes back to my statement earlier, if you can code, you can code. and um, if you have the skills to analyze tracking data, you can help every professional franchise because it is hard to use that data. And so there are skills that are transferable from one sport to the next. The subject-specific knowledge is tricky. Uh, there's a lot of submissions to the Big Data Bowl that maybe miss American football context, um, but you don't always have to have that context. I mean, the, I think the group that won our 2020 competition was a pair of Austrian data scientists who had never watched the game before. Um, uh, one of our finalists last year was a, a, a couple from Japan who traveled to Indianapolis with their uh, 
several young children, uh, and they too had not watched American football, um, but they were able to pick up the context pretty fast. So um, the, the skills that you can learn in one sport most definitely will help in another sport. I also think context-wise, we're learning at the NFL League office, we're learning from every other sport. You know, what baseball is trying this year with timing, we're learning from. Um, what hockey's done with their challenge system and offsides, we're learning from. You know, there there is trial and error from all these other leagues, and in the more global perspective you have about what's going on in other sports, um, it, it will help you make better decisions. You, you might not necessarily realize it right away, uh, but that, that perspective has definitely helped our team. Thanks, Rod. Um, so I, I guess first, uh, I want to acknowledge that you all have put in a lot of time and effort into these initiatives, and thank you for that. We've heard a lot about what you've done, how you've done it, advice for future people. I guess I'm hoping before this ends, we can hear like some happy, positive success stories. So I want to hear you each brag about one success story from your respective initiatives that uh, will hopefully inspire other people in the audience to, you know, do the same thing. Well, I feel like we have lots of success stories and they may not be huge. In other words, when a, when a student tells me that they want to be a sports data analyst. Like I've had that happen. Like that, since from the beginning of the camp, they didn't even know what that was. But for them to actually have that as something that they may pursue. I mean, again, our, our camp is relatively new in terms of us tracking students. So I don't have a lot of data in terms of them going you know, past high school. But when you hear those types of stories, to me, that is extremely, I mean, that's the whole point, right? But the other thing that I feel like is a huge success for our project is that we are able to partner with a historically black college and university in Baltimore, um, Coppin State University, and to expose that community in which, where that university sits. Um, it's a pretty much a predominantly low-income community, and for kids to be coming um, into that university and working with undergraduates and uh, seeing themselves differently. I think that that's, to me, is that's what it's all about for me. I, I would say, um, you know, we've spent most of what we've done on the grant so far um, on infrastructure, but I think the reaction from the stat education community has been incredible. I mean, I, I think it has been lots of people wanting to know how they can contribute and how they can be part of this um, because they see value in it. I uh, just took out my phone. We have six previous Big Data Bowl mentees that are currently working in professional sports um, that I, I know of, um, and it was pretty cool about 20 minutes ago, Tegan mentioned one of them from a women's sports data conference. Um, all those folks are extremely talented. They likely would be in professional sports without our program, um, but the, the chances that you know maybe one or two of them weren't and, and that our program helped them get there, uh, I think is our, our best success story. Yeah, it, it feels almost like stolen valor um, for me to cite the accomplishments of, um, of the women who have been speakers, panelists, attendees, um, and, and used um, the opportunity of women in sports data um, to be the springboard, you know, whether they needed it or not to enter this industry. Um, but I, I think the success of, of the event and showing that it's been viable has been uh, incredibly validating. Um, uh, when I brought this idea to um, my general manager, Sean Marks, um, at the Brooklyn Nets, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people um, you know, said, well, let, like, let's scale back like, this idea because I, I wanted to host it um, on the practice court, um, which has this gorgeous view of lower Manhattan. Um, you know, it's the court that Kevin Durant played on. Um, and he, he was like, I love this idea. This is a lot of work. 
um, like, why don't you just invite people, um, you know, like a smaller group? Um, we can have it in the media room, um, like just for, like for the first concept event. Like I'm, I'm all like on board, and and I, I was like, no, I think we're gonna need a bigger room. Uh, and so for the event in its second year to have over 250 people on site at the ballpark, uh, and you know for people to be standing uh, in the back, um, clamoring to hear um, Ishani speak. Um, like that, I felt was a really powerful underscore of, of this event being not only important but essential for our community. And and she slayed. Is that the jargon? She slayed. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to keep up to date with the lingo. As someone um, who was at the Women in Sports Day Symposium, along with a lot of our, our team at the Pirates, and now this, this week's conference, two great conferences, and looking forward to the Carnegie Mellon one, which was mentioned later this year, three great conferences, um, and thankful to be at these. Um, curious about, you know, Tegan mentioned, um, uh, you know, access and representation um, and, and, you know, technical roles. One thing that's not always an automatic translation that sometimes people in technical roles want to get into is leadership. Um, and, and that's also an important part about, um, that's like underrepresented. So uh, just curious if you have any thoughts for those who are interested in further growing into leadership roles in sports, um, including those from underrepresented backgrounds, if you have any advice, mentorship, or anything like that for, for them. Um. Yeah, advice, um, I think we talked a little bit about this um, at the panel that I moderated at Women in Sports D Data, um, which centered on, on leadership. Uh, and we had um, a general manager, an assistant general manager, an assistant coach, um, and the Philly's own director of baseball operations, Corinne Landry. And I was really kind of curious about exactly this question of like, how do you build your squad? How do you model leadership when, um, you're essentially the only one. And I do like hate that that construction of like being the only one in the room, but I mean, it, 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 it is very um, isolating, not necessarily from a combative um, uh, point of view, but you just don't necessarily have somebody else that you can reach out to. And I think it was also one of the motivating factors um, for starting uh, Women in Sports Data with Sarah Gallus of the Astros and Diana Ma um, at the Lakers, um, because we had found that in an environment like professional sports, you're so strongly um, discouraged from um, talking to other team pers personnel in a very candid way because you know everything is a competitive advantage you know, keep it secret keep it safe um, but then we noticed that our male colleagues naturally had that network um, whether it was at, in the team context or um, people that they knew um, who had left um, the team or just you know general um, sociability I think baseball is a little friendlier than basketball um, uh, and, and I noticed that um, when I would go to summer league um, uh, at the NBA, you know, I, the people that I, I, I would talk to would be former Sixers people um, who had gone to other teams. Uh, but then it was really difficult to get to know um, other people um, that I didn't have a connection to and not having that um, naturally set up. Um, so the transition to, to a leadership role um, explicitly and, and having management responsibilities um, it was something that I had thought a lot about because it can be, um, you know, tech is, is, is kind of cruel in a way that um, your coding ability is kind of the most valued um, and that leadership skills, uh, particularly in software engineering, require um, a really strong technical background, but it's not a skill that you get to practice um, on a daily basis. And so I was really concerned that um, you know, I'd be managing a very large software engineering team in disciplines that I didn't have act, active um, experience in. No problem with being opinionated, of course, but, <laughs> um, you know, having the confidence, having the, um, the sense of, of, of authority um, in this type of industry. So I, I ended up reaching out to 
um, a lot of my friends um, who work both in industry and um, in sports uh, and just ask them for advice of, you know, what, um, what's, what's management 101 to you? Um, I read a lot of books because I like to read. Um, listen to a lot of podcasts, um, but I think the one thing that I do like to do the most is have conversations and, and check in um, with my group. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think it's it's been a pretty um, powerful experience because um, not only am I in a leadership position in professional sports, but I also get to manage other women. Uh, and I think uh, with the exception of a couple other teams, um, such as the Astros, most people have never had a female manager in sports. Uh, and so it's, it's bo both a great um, example for um, my software engineers, but I think for the rest of my group to see that like this is kind of the default. It, there's a 50-50 chance, um, or should be, uh, and uh, I, I think the that it's become unremarkable. Hey guys, uh, my name is Hua Gong. I'm from uh, at Rice University. Uh, so I am teaching a lot of sport analytics uh, courses and. Uh, we have a lot of students uh, who double major in sport analytics or either computer science or statistics. And one thing I find out is that uh, a lot of my students, when they graduate, uh, they went into industries in probably finance or uh, tech companies who maybe pay them more than uh, the sports analyst jobs. So I think my question was, I'm, I'm always thinking about, is do you guys have any advice to, uh, on how I can convince those people, convince those students to stay in the sports industry? Because they're, I think they're very talented and they, they are passionate about sports, but in terms of finance, they probably more, uh, they probably are more willing to go to the other industries. Uh, so how do, how do, how do we, convince those students to stay in the sports industry? Well, I mean, that's kind of a value proposition, right? Do they value um, income um, or monetary compensation more than other fringe benefits that sports can give them? I, like, I think that's a, a personal choice. I, I find myself trying to convince people who could make vast like, amounts of money more um, than, than they would working at the Phillies. And I think that we, we do actually have a, a pretty good compensation tier um, in software engineering. Um, and, and for me, um, I, I think it comes down to um, the problem space is unique um, because we get to work uh, in creating a joy factory um, or a misery factory if you're a Philadelphia <laughs> sports fan. Um, but there's something kind of pure and academic about working in sports that you're thinking about uh, how do I push people to peak human performance? How do I create a winning contending championship team um, over the course of seasons? How do I you know, assemble a, a roster um, that's competitive um, across the span of our star players um, years of performance. And I, I find those questions really compelling and to be, part, be a part of just a small part of um, someone's on-field success. Um, I, I, I would I would value it more than a conventional job. And I also think that it's taught me a lot of um, hard skills. Um, it's like working in a startup. Um, to, to work in sports, um, but you don't necessarily have to worry about like runway. You're not going to IPO, so um, you get you develop a lot of range to work in sports. And I think there's a similar question um, about like developing range on like sports domain. Like how do you go from baseball to basketball to football to gymnastics? Um, 
And I think that once you pivot, uh, or you, you can be extremely successful working in sports if you pivot from, I only care about the sports part and more towards, I only care about the problem and this is the most fun application I could possibly do. Um, that's my pitch. If it, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. But um, if it sparks like this idea of like I also want to be a member of the Joy Factory Parade, then it, that that person is going to really enjoy working for the Phillies. And we have the fanatic, so it's kind of an unfair advantage. The vast majority of time that people open open up a big data bull data set and try to answer a question, they are the first person ever to answer that specific question, and that's a really cool thing in sports. Uh, and the intellectual stimulation that you know our team still gets out of the questions that the league office is asking us to do um, really keeps us motivated. And so building off of what Tegan said, you get to answer really, really interesting questions. I wouldn't force anyone into sports um, because the downside of thinking along those lines is that you force people into jobs where they're working longer hours, they have to make sacrifices with their families or with their friends, and that's, that's not for everyone. Um, my, my hope is that, you know, with our team at the league office, we don't feel like we're working 70 hours a week. Um, in some sense, we're not defined by winning and losing, which is, is good and bad. It's bad because, you know, we don't have a mascot. Um, we have 32 of them, I guess. Um, but the, the, you know, I try to make sure our team has a, a reasonable work-life balance. Um, but, you know, I can't guarantee that's the same with every professional sports organization. So I certainly wouldn't feel like you have to force people into the field or that you want to push them there. But the questions are really interesting. And then the other thing is, it's pretty cool to have sports on your resume. And so even if they, if you look at it as, a, as I'm going to try something in sports, um, you know, if you're going into sports and then maybe going into something more, more common in tech, um, you're going to have a unique application. No mascot, but you've got a shield, right? <laughs> One more question. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Underhand. It's mostly the question for when, you know, Lawrence, and when you're working with younger kids, I'm very curious what kind of questions are they asking when they start to learn that, you know, they can work in sports? outside of like the professional athlete capability. Like very curious what their minds are thinking about. Well, they're, they're not shy, so they wanna know how much money that you can make. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing. They'll literally ask our people who come and present, how much money do you make, you know? So, um, but they don't really have a sense of what work is really at that age. You know, they're curious, they're excited about sports. And I think what's really interesting is, are the, the questions that they ask when it comes to their projects at the end, because that kind of gives you a sense of how they're thinking. And, um, and they really come up with some really interesting, you know, questions. So I, I just feel like it's more about just cultivating that curiosity. And then once they realize that they can learn new and more complex tools and methods to answer their questions. It, it just builds, you know, they're just too young to really understand the, what, <laughs> what work really is. And um, so, I, I, yeah, we just try to keep, we kind of keep it right there. We, we expose them to, to professions, but where they really get excited is, is being exposed to the undergraduates who are majoring in the, because it's almost like it's a, it's a, clear jump to, you know, path to where those students are versus where someone who's in, in the field, you know, so we, we are, we're conscious of that. <laughs> yeah, we're too old to talk to them about that. All right, let's give a round of applause for our speech.